Good afternoon. Uh, this is Christopher Coase, and I would like to welcome you to joining our monthly webinar series. Uh, today, we will be featuring um, our very own Bob Stevens, Principal of MS Development, to discuss uh, as part of our webinar series for today, financing for projects that don't pencil out. Uh, today, if you want to learn about innovative ways to finance difficult and challenging development projects, this webinar is for you. As I said before, I am Christopher Coase, Vice President of Locus uh, and Director, <clears throat> uh, sorry, Vice President of Smart of America and a Director of Locus. Uh, Locus, for the last uh, seven years, has been focused on bringing uh, public policy aligned to the market demands for walkable urbanism. Uh, for the past uh, year, Locus has been hosting these monthly series. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about how to participate in Locus, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, let me talk a little bit about our panelists who will be joining with us. Uh, Bob Stevens is a principal at m uh, Development. He is a professional engineer, a principal, and president founder of Stevens & Associates. He has over 25 years of experience leading teams in a variety of projects and disciplines. As a principal for MS Development, Bob directs professionals to organize and guide business leaders, institutions, and communities to redevelop and revitalize main streets and downtowns. His knowledge of new markets, tax credits, historic tax credits, grants, equity, and debt enables him to identify project needs and develop sound solutions. We welcome your comments and questions about this topic. For those of you following along on the web today, you can type your questions in the chat box on your screen. You can also tweet them at Locus Developers. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. And uh, with that, I would like to hand it off to our very own Bob Stevens. Bob, take it away. Great. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We, um, we've got a lot to cover in uh, 40, 40 or so minutes. Um, and um, I, I did want to start a little bit to give you some background. As Christopher said, I come from this, I'm an engineer. I started as a design professional. And, um, and truthfully got into development um, back in 2011 when in my community I had a building that um, effectively uh, had a fire and, and as, my, uh, as I was working for my client at the time, realized that that building was never going to get rebuilt. Uh, and, and that started us on a pathway of figuring out how in communities that, uh, where the economy really doesn't work sufficiently to build a project or renovate a project, and yet a community really needs to continue to move forward and make investments and improve how you can put that together. So that's mostly what I'm going to cover today. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and the next slide. So uh, we're going to start with uh, explaining why these projects don't work, work out, uh, why they don't pencil out, why the numbers don't come together, why nobody is coming from out of town to do a project in your town. Uh, I should say there's a few exceptions to that. There are places where development works, first, second tier cities, but most of rural America and small towns are having a very difficult time trying to build construction projects. Um, how uh, you can take um, both capitalize on sources of funds that are out there, uh, tax credits, other grant programs will stay out of the, uh, uh, the, the legislation that came out of the, uh, uh, the federal government last week, which might be putting, uh, making some changes to the, some of those programs, but some will still be around, we're sure, uh, at the end of this session, and uh, it would still apply. Uh, so we'll have to, uh, we can go back to questions if, if people want to get into that a little bit to say what the implications are from the proposed uh, tax uh, uh, change. Uh, but suffice to say, there's, a, there's an efficient way to bring those in which don't have uh, implications for tax liability for you as a developer. Community-enabled development, alternative lending, and subscription-based housings are all strategies that we have developed around trying to um, have your community act as a developer and the advantages to that and how that can make a project successful that would otherwise not really be viable. Next slide, please. So this is why projects aren't happening in many towns across the country. The bottom line is, is that on the projects that I work on, and I work in, you know, as I say, rural uh, New England, um, we work in typically places that are economically disadvantaged. Um, and in general, the project cost at the end of the day cost essentially $300 a square foot, 
And if I go out and get an appraisal for that building as completed, the appraisal comes in at $100 a square foot. That gap is tremendous, and that gap is why uh, when, we, when I first went to a LOCUS conference and communities were standing up and saying, hey, we have a project that uh, anybody who wants to come and develop that, that's why developers aren't lining up to run to those places. It just doesn't make economic sense. We go to the next slide. So I'm going to walk you through, uh, for many of you on, on, uh, on this webinar, you might already understand this, but there's some really specific reasons why uh, uh, projects are valued and why they cost a certain amount. And this is, this is essentially why. So in commercial real estate, um, the value of a project is driven off your operating budget. Um, that's driven by the revenue, as you can see in this sample 50,000 square foot downtown mixed use building, and the expenses. The expenses are, um, you know, they add up to $5.60 a square foot on an annual basis. Those are, that's a high performance building. That's a building that's been renovated. It's operating very efficiently. Um, and it is, you know, you're just not going to run a building for much less than that. You can certainly see that number climb to seven, eight, nine dollars a square foot. Um, but uh, for older buildings or buildings that have not been renovated that have a higher energy cost, but essentially, um, this is assuming you have a, a deep energy retrofit or renovated building, and you're trying to drive this at a pretty efficient cost per square foot. The revenue is driven not by the building cost, not by what you've spent to renovate it, but really by, by what your marketplace will pay for. So at the end of the day, it all comes back to what is the market uh, in your community for housing, office, and retail. And so we've taken a typical sort of mixed-use building and use numbers that we're used to seeing. So um, housing, housing is a market that is uh, right now stronger than the other markets that we've seen. You know, there's a, there's a growing preference, as most of us know, for baby booners and, and others, people with economic means to sort of move into walkable places if they are uh, a walkable place that has amenity. Um, Office is uh, weak. Um, office is not as strong as, as housing. There are exceptions to that. Uh, there are ways to sort of find office tenants that might pay a little more. And actually, retail is about as uh, weak as you can get. As most of you know that are in this industry, we, uh, retail is going through a huge transformation in this country. We've overbuilt too much retail space out there. Um, for bricks and mortars in downtowns, um, we're trying to figure out new strategies to build experience, to um, have people who are selling online behind that, to um, figure out how to subsidize those. We, uh, on the projects that we're putting together today, we literally are looking at how do we get our housing and office tenants to pay higher rents so that we can go out on the street with lower rents for um, the uh, uh, the retail and keep those full because as someone said recently you know if you don't have an active streetscape and a lively downtown you're never going to fill the upstairs as well so it's not really viable to just roll out and say we're not going to have retail or that can, space can move to office you really do want retail and restaurants to work on the ground floor um, and they, there is a synergy you know if you can fill the upstairs that'll help keep the downstairs going. So in this scenario, this sample building, um, uh, if you look down at the bottom, there's an earnings of $440,000 um, uh, at the bottom. That is what drives the value of the building. I'll show you that in the next slide. Uh, it also drives how much you can borrow. So the debt service is, in this case, 80% uh, of value or a, a, a debt coverage ratio, which is to say that it's not, you know, you still have 20 or 30 percent um, uh, excess cash after you've paid your debt service. You can't put it all to debt service. They won't loan you the money. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is an example of a typical project and the cost to construct. So I said a minute ago that, you know, you have value and you have the cost. Um, you know, an acquisition cost per square foot, which is typical for a historic building in my area, design costs, soft costs. Soft costs are probably um, a little high because we have complex, probably the most complex projects in the country. We're using different financing sources, new market tax credits among them, which are very complex and have a high transactional cost. The cost to build at 220 a square foot, probably a little high, high for some places in the country. Um, you know, for a historic building rehab, we're 190 to 210. We can see 220 depending on the level of fit up at the end of the day. Um, it is probably a little lower 
than new construction. So believe it or not, um, we find new construction harder to finance than than historic renovations, uh, both because the cost to construct is higher uh, and because one of the principal subsidies we use is historic tax credits, and we don't have those tax credits for new construction. So there's the $294 a square foot cost to construct, not quite 300, but round numbers about the same. And the value of that building is all driven off the earnings from the previous spreadsheet. That $440,000 net operating income, um, we use appraisers use a cap rate, 8.5% cap rate's a reasonable one. Um, that means that this building is worth $5 million after construction. So uh, begin to start to see this problem here. Um, you know, five million. It costs you 14.7 million dollars to build this building, and the appraiser is telling you it's worth 5.1. Um, if you look at what you can borrow <laughs> at 80% of value, you know, you have a, a maximum debt of around five million dollars uh, on a 14 million dollar project, and therefore a, a gap of about 9.7 million dollars. Um, to pull this project together and do something. Um, so if you have questions on these numbers, we're going to go to the end, but this is sort of, we can come back to these slides later, but this is sort of the heart of the problem is really defined and looking at these costs. And again, they are costs that are directly from sample projects in the database. If we can go to the next project. Go ahead. Uh, Bob, and you said the sample project is a nationwide or is it a specific region? It's my region, so these are uh, about a dozen different projects where I took um, operating costs uh, from renovated buildings and uh, market studies that we've done in, in New England, essentially. Um, but we think that although the numbers vary uh, from the conversations we've had around the country, uh, in, in rural America, this is pretty typical. Um, and even in, in, in many urban places, that are not having an economy that's booming. Um, you know, if you go down, as I live in the, on the Connecticut River Valley, and we always say if you go between here and the ocean, I'm in Vermont, for those that are, that are wondering, you go to Springfield, Mass., Hartford, Connecticut, these numbers are the same there. Um, and there, it's also true for industrial projects. This is a mixed-use project, but the gap between the cost to build for industrial projects and the resulting value is not as bad as mixed use, but it's still at least $100 a square foot. So um, if you are in the business of trying to put a project together uh, and look at a, an investor for a return on investment, um, it's not there. Uh, it is not there for the level of risk involved, a nominal return on investment. Thank you. And just for those who are on the call, um, just so for those who ask what is DCR, that's debt coverage ratio. And uh, for EBITDA is uh, earnings before interest, tax, and amortization. So uh, we'll go uh, back to you, Bob. Okay, next slide, please. So here, here are some sources uh, to try to fill that gap. Um, these are kind of the typical ones. Um, first of all is equity, and um, that's the you know, developer's equity investment. Uh, in this project, you know, we're showing a $500,000 equity investment. Some of you may be thinking, well, you know, if you're going to make an investment, why don't you just close your gap with that? Uh, you know, get somebody who has uh, equity to invest and have them invest $3 million. Well, an equity investor is also looking at some point to get paid back with interest. And typically in real estate development, that's, that's a, you know, because of the risk involved, um, you know, they want double-digit return on investments. Uh, some of them can be patient. They can wait 10 uh, usually, typically, the performers are run on a 10-year um, uh, return on investment, but um, some people might wait 15 or 20. But uh, there's a limit to what people are willing to invest in, considering the, the considerable risk involved in a real estate development project. Um, we can awful, often borrow more than 80% of value, so we call that mezzanine debt. Um, there are states, uh, many states have historic tax credits. Federal historic tax credits, we like that one. That's, by the way, on the chopping block at the moment uh, with the, uh, the tax code rewrite. Um, but that uh, can be up to 20% of the project cost uh, for a historic uh, project. And then new market tax credits in, in certain census tracts, which are economically disadvantaged, that can be another 20 to 25% of your project cost. Um, those two alone, the new market tax credits and the federal historic tax credits, those are sources of funding that effectively you don't need to pay back. 
Um, and, and that is, you know, that unfortunately for the projects that we do in, in areas where the economy is not robust enough to pay us higher rents, those are the sources that we need to get these projects off the ground and try to make an improvement that starts to transform a community. So, so that 40%, if you will, uh, 35 to 40% of the project costs through, through those two tax credit programs gives us a fighting chance. It's still not easy. You know, at that point with this scenario, we still have almost a three, uh, $3.7 million gap. And then we start looking at other sources. Uh, community Development Block Grants is what CDBG stands for. Um, EPA, if you have environmental work, there's brownfield money, efficiency grants, and so on. Um, and uh, taking those sources and bringing them into the project is, is again, critical to um, trying to close that. I'll come back to the remaining gap and some of the other strategies that we've used to fix this. But uh, again, this is a key, you know, the ones in the top box uh, uh, until last Thursday, we thought these were pretty solid strategies. Um, uh, and hopefully they'll survive uh, the, the work in Washington and they'll still be avail available to us. Uh, and then we'll start to focus on the remainder of these uh, sources um, in terms of how to solve the bigger problems. Uh, next slide, please. So we, this section is really uh, something entitled community-enabled development, and um, it's predicated on this assumption. Uh, in, if you are a community like the ones that we work in, where it doesn't make economic sense to do development, somebody on a white horse is not riding in and, gonna, and going to renovate your downtown or make your, your downtown work better. Um, there really isn't, no matter how you slice it, an adequate return on investment for the um, risk involved for somebody who's into this just because, of, just because they're looking for a return on investment. So there is a model. This is a model that's, that we've titled Community Enabled Development, where you go to your community and you say, you know, who in the community um, has a vested interest in this town being successful and might be willing to share that risk uh, if it's a nominal investment to look at it almost as a philanthropic uh, investment. And this, this is the conversation that we have with investors in this case. We say, well, you know, we need to raise in this model project, say, half a million dollars, uh, and uh, be great if we can pay you that back. Be great if in 10 and 15 years, maybe 20 years, you get a return on that investment. But, um, but don't make this investment because of that. You have to assume that it might work out that you don't get paid back at all, and this is a charitable contribution. But at the end of the day, if you've helped revitalize your downtown, if you've added to the local economy, uh, if you've made other projects because that economy starts to get a spark better, uh, then uh, it is a way to, um, to see returns in, in other respects. Um, I do have a, a couple of sample projects that I'm going to show you where this is ongoing, but the community uh, can be, take the lead as the developers. And in the case of the first project we did, it was five uh, young business people in town that said, you know, we were going to rebuild this project, and we each ponied up, you know, an equal amount, which ended up to being a million or a million and a quarter on a $23 million project. Uh, again, with this model, uh, it's a fairly nominal equity investment to leverage a lot of other sources of funds. Uh, and that project is four years in operation, and all the bills are getting paid, and it's you know 90, 95 percent occupied as projected. Um, another uh, project that we're involved with right now has a, a group of uh, civics and institutional leaders who have come around the table, a hospital, a bank, a college, and have said, "Look, we can't." We can't be successful in our businesses in this town if our downtown is dead. So we will step up and invest a quarter million, $300,000 each, um, and, and, and be the equity investors in this downtown project. And in addition to that, we will also be a tenant. So part of the project, getting this project off the ground, is going to lenders. And when you have a very complicated project, uh, they get very nervous. Uh, how do they know that we're going to be able to pay the, 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 the loans back? How do they know that our projections, you can do a market study and say I'm going to rent you know, office space at this rate, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that that will prove out. So who's taking that risk? Um, if you have a bankable tenant, if you have a college or a hospital who says, okay, I will rent 20% uh, of this building and we'll move you know, we were going to build on our campus, but no, we'll move our development office down into your building. Um, that's 
that's a lease that I can go to a bank and get a loan on, and they'll have confidence that um, uh, that the loans will be paid because of that that lease. Um, it's also true we've had been successful of getting state institutions or state colleges. Again, a state lease, uh, even if it's 10, 15, 20 percent of your building, is something that you can go to the bank uh, and borrow money against and give confidence that the project uh, will happen. The other great um, element that we didn't realize when we first started this conversation is that if your community leaders are the ones who are the developers, uh, they're also, they, they are also the network with other uh, folks in your town. And your tenants, whether they're residential tenants, retail tenants, otherwise, um, they're going to come from your community and they're going to come from that network of people that you know. So as the community's uh, leaders, if they are the development team, if you will, um, there are others that w will want to be part of this. And we literally go out and say, look, great if you like to invest, great if you want to become part of this leadership team, but also equally good if you're willing to sign a lease and become a tenant. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's the operational risk of filling this building up is real and significant, particularly for retail and for office. So um, it is a, uh, a great key um, to success for community projects to have a group of local people it also starts to dispel this myth of, well, there's some you know, uh, developer who is only out for their own interests coming from the big city, and you know, they don't care about the benefits of the community. It changes the perception. You know, in many ways, developer is a dirty word, and for many NIMBYs and people in our community, well, uh, this helps change that perception. This is the community itself trying to revitalize a community, and, it, and you know, we try to explain to them this conversation. The return on investment, if it's there, is pretty far out. So there's the philanthropic equity uh, piece. One, one other story about this, the, the benefit of this. We, we were, um, when, we, when we do get a project that we think is viable, even with the community uh, leaders in it, we then feel like our next job is to go hunt for tenants. You know, we have to get, in order to get to closing, our lenders are looking for a building to be pre-leased to 70%. Um, and so I'm out there, you know, trying to rent apartments without even owning the buildings yet or without doing any renovations and, and retail spaces. Um, we happen to be courting a hardware store for a downtown. And we were talking to this hardware store and saying, well, you know, how can we convince you that this would be a good investment for you? We want a little more rent than you're used to in some of these areas that you're used to practicing uh, because we need that rent to make this work. Um, and we were standing there with three of the larger institutions in town, and, and the hardware owner said, well, you know, if you can commit that the hospital, the college, and the, you know, the other college will buy their supplies through the hardware store, I'm confident I can rent from you. So we were able to use the purchasing power of our, our community leaders, and I think you could do the same thing you know, with the state or others, you know, folks that really spend a lot of money in whether paper products or hardware products and use that or, or food to help um, bolster uh, um, your retail tenancy, which again is, is a challenge. Next slide. So, uh, so this is the case study. This is a downtown block in Bennington uh, that, that I was referring to. It's about four and a half acres. Um, there's uh, a number on, on the drawing that you're looking at on the upper right, there's a cluster of historic buildings and then the buildings that are in the center of the project are, uh, well, they're 50s and 60s editions of large um, lumberyard kind of buildings. This is, an, this is the main intersection of an existing historic town. So the gas station on the upper left corner and the auto-oriented uh, lumberyard are probably out of context. You go to the next uh, slide. And this, this is the proposed plan. So there are four historic buildings that are kept and then three new buildings on the, on the upper and, and left side and the parkings in the center. So again, trying to reestablish the streetscape, sort of good urban form. Um, I, I just, you know, as an example, want to, to walk through. We are assuming that uh, the historic tax credits come back. We are three or four months from closing on phase one on this project, but I'm going to walk you through building by building and talk about uh, who's in these buildings because that was key to uh, signing leases and get to close uh, and, and have a project that's economically viable and underwritable 
to get to closing. Um, if you start on the lower right, um, the first building, which is just a blank box, uh, is outside of the project. That's the one building in this block that's not in it. But the next one, which has a ridge line, is an old courthouse. The ground floor of that, we're relocating an existing cafe and a local bookstore to the ground floor. And the second floor was one of our investors who's a tech company. It's a two-story courthouse, old courthouse space, which will you know, the, have a beautiful sort of office for them. Uh, so it's fully rented at a, at a, a slightly higher than normal um, uh, office rate. Uh, the next building on the corner, which is the signature historic uh, uh, Italianate building, on the ground floor is all retail. At the moment, we only have a couple of retail spaces uh, rented. We're courting restaurants. Uh, we have a, uh, a local uh, proprietor who's going to have a small uh, satellite uh, retail store and an old barber shop that's been there since the beginning who's staying. But other than that, the first floor is empty. But the upper two floors are – there are 17 housing units. Uh, that building, by the way, has not been occupied in the upper floors since the 1970s. Uh, so we are providing um, above market, high, I guess you'd say that they're above market uh, apartment buildings that are one and two bedroom, some with balconies, uh, some common space, uh, rooftop deck, uh, you know, level of amenities, which are hardwood floors and granite counters and nice cabinets, those kinds of nice trim packages. Um, and we're able to be in at, um, you know, something uh, there, there's a mixture of price points, but some that are at 80 to 120 percent of medium family income, and then maybe a third to half that are um, uh, that are you know 140, 160, you know higher end. Um, of those 17 units in the upper two floors, all but three of them are rented right now. Most of them are rented by the college who was looking for. Um, uh, housing for faculty and uh, by the hospital who was looking for housing for their uh, doctors who they're trying to recruit and bring to their campus. So a good chunk of that second floor is rented again from our tenants, uh, but the marketplace has also stepped up and they, that market is pretty strong. A lot of seniors, baby boomers who would be looking for the, uh, those units. The next building over, which is it's one building, but there's three or four roof lines there. It's a conglomeration of different buildings joined together Again, a historic building. Uh, ground floor, um, the front, there's three small retail spaces I don't have tenants for. So by the way, anybody on the session that's looking to move to Bennington and open a retail, talk to me afterwards. Uh, the rear portion of the first floor is office. We have a, a local uh, affordable housing group, a local engineering company that's on the ground floor. And the second floor is... Um, uh, filled by the college's development office. So they were growing. They needed space for their development office, and we said, don't build on your campus. Come and rent from us. They're renting from us. They're paying $23 a square foot, uh, which is you know almost $6 a square foot higher than uh, the going rate in that town. And we said, you need to not only rent, you need to pay a higher rent so that the, the financing works for our debt. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute as one of the alternative funding sources because we have another source of funds because of them. Uh, and, and then the third floor of that building is dedicated to graduate housing. So again, it's fully rented from, uh, to the college. They have a need for graduate student housing, and so we put that in that building. Um, continuing to the left, next building over is actually a one-story existing community theater, which is staying. The new building, which has kind of a truck loading dock in the back, that's a downtown grocery store, 11,000 square foot grocery store. We have a tenant. This is phase two now. Um, we have a tenant uh, that we're, we've been talking to for a while who has a letter of interest. We haven't closed the deal, but it looks like we'll have a grocery proprietor. There's some liner stores in the front of that to have an active Main Street. And then the upper floors are three stories of what we're calling subscription housing. Again, I'm going to come back to that in a minute uh, because uh, that's – I'm trying to remember, 26 units of um, housing, one two-bedroom housing. Its targeted population uh, is um, mostly uh, baby boomers, uh, but people looking to age in place that might be looking for an authentic downtown experience where they need some support, uh, but they don't want to be in a dedicated senior housing place. And we're going to talk about how we're trying to finance that piece of support and the higher level of amenities for that building. And then the building on the corner on the, on the left, uh, we call that the medical building because the ground floor, um, we're now moving away from the central block of our town. We've, we've sort of accepted that 
office on the streetscape uh, might be acceptable. So we have a, a medical clinic on the first floor, uh, visiting nurses on the second. Uh, we have a couple of nonprofits, planning uh, office uh, and, um, yeah, planning office on the third. Uh, and then the fourth floor of that building is dedicated, again, to housing uh, with about a third of it targeted for uh, specifically for a nursing program because there's a um, one of the other colleges in town has a off-campus nursing school and they would move that school into this building so you'd have uh, some housing for students in the top floor you have a nursing school in the building and then a medical clinic and medical uh, providers in the in the ground floor um, the last building in this block which is on the lower left is a uh, is what we call phase three and that's probably a housing townhouse project that gets uh, reintroduced. Um, at this point, we're trying to get phase one and two done. Next slide. So, um, so that project uh, gives you some ideas. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to talk about alternative um, lending and how it fits into that a little bit. So these are some of the ways that we've, we've started to fill the rest of the gap on this project. Um, community foundations, uh, I don't need to say a lot about that. There are other targeted equity or um, uh, you know, foundations that exist for the purpose of serving and improving in communities. Um, sometimes uh, in the case of the project that I just described, um, they are uh, coming in as um, both lenders for pre-development, so high risk lending early on before we go to close, and then and some of their, their money is coming in as preferred equity. So let me talk about preferred equity for a minute. Um, we set up a structure in the first mixed use project we did where we had a $600,000 gap in our financing. We had exhausted lending sources in general. Um, we didn't have collateral to borrow additional money, but we knew we had a project that the community wanted to see. And so we went out to the community and said, look, we will uh, sell uh, equity to this building and this will work effectively like a loan. Um, it will be, um, we will pay you 3% return on investment for this equity uh, and uh, we will buy your shares back at the end of 10 years. And if we don't buy it back, you will have the same standing as the, as the initial equity investors in the project. Um, it's effectively a way to do a community loan but um, it allowed us to go out and say, you know, this is an equity investment. Um, some really clever people said, um, look, you know, you can also do this as a dedicated IRA. So uh, one of our um, uh, um, uh, companies and trust companies in town set up an IRA for the project uh, and people who had the ability to take 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars in their IRA and shift it over to, into the uh, in this case, it was the Brooks House IRA for 10 years. They were able to do that, and we raised about $650,000 through this method. Um, so that's, uh, that's a way to, to add additional, effectively, we, I, I look at it as debt. It is equity, but it's debt behind all the other debt. It's debt that's not secured by collateral. Um, it is debt that you have to service interest on, but it's interest only until 10 years. And at which point, if you run the operating pro formas, 10 years from now, you've paid down enough of your equity on your, on your real loans uh, that you're servicing that you can refinance and get enough equity out to pay this, pay this back. At least that's the theory anyway. The next bullet is um, USDA facility uh, loans. Um, they only recently have, um, this is rural development now, so communities less than 10,000, uh, uh, I think that's what it is, less than 10,000 people. Well, that doesn't sound quite right, but in any case, it's rural development, uh, USDA facility loan um, is available as a loan with a very good term, very good interest rate for nonprofits only. Um, so we have, a, we have a whole bunch of structural issues here, which we probably don't have time to get into. We're capitalizing on new market tax credits and federal historic tax credits. You need to be a for-profit entity to collect those, particularly for the historic tax credits. You can only have, I think, 40% of your tenancy as nonprofits. But for the portion that is a nonprofit, we created a new nonprofit whose sole purpose was to renovate space and rent it to other nonprofits. And with a signed lease from this case, the college, um, we were able to go to USDA and say that um, we want to borrow money for tenant fit up. So 
Uh, it's not borrowed for the project, but we essentially said, you know, drew a line in the sand and say, well, the building construction, this much of it is shell, and this much of it is tenant fit up. And for that tenant fit up, which is about $1.7 million, um, we want to borrow money uh, from uh, USDA for fit up for this tenant. It's collateralized and it is secured based on the lease only from the nonprofit. And it's a nonprofit that's bankable, so they gave us a long lease, they agreed to it. Um, but, uh, but that was a way to bring another million seven in debt without having to add additional collateral. And let me back up a little bit and see if I can explain this. So your, your limitation on how much you can borrow is limited by two factors. One is the appraised value of the building, which ultimately acts as collateral. You don't want to be beyond 80% of the value of the building. Um, that's one limitation. The other limitation is the cash flow out of the building and how much you have left over after you've paid your debt, that debt coverage ratio. So there are cases where you have more uh, operating income to cover debt than you have value to borrow against, which is the case that we had here. So we were able to borrow additional money, show that we could make those payments because our operating income is enough to still have enough in reserve to borrow the money originally, but there's a limit to that. You can't keep, there's some point where you just can't pay more debt and it needs to be free money to close that gap. And then the last one I've mentioned, many of you may be aware of the EV-5 program, um, uh, uh, foreign investors uh, looking to place money to get uh, a green card to emigrate to the country through that program, $500,000 a pop. Um, it is, that program though, um, it, it is effectively like debt. It, is, it comes in as equity, but there's a promise, there's a pro forma, there's certainly an obligation to pay that back. It is not free money, it's equity with the expectation that at the end of the compliance period, they may not get any or much interest, but they're expecting to get their money back. So um, it, it doesn't solve the free money problem, but if you have the capacity to handle debt or look at debt in a different way uh, where you don't have to service it as much, the EV-5 is a program that can help fill that. Next slide. So uh, this is the, uh, the last sort of general topic that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, we call it tenant financed housing. Uh, we actually got this idea out of the Locust Conference in um, Boston two years ago. And I can't think of the gentleman's name who's doing this down in DC. Uh, Christopher, you may, may be able to fill in the blank for me, um, who had a very good discussion about, you know, building places uh, in communities, walkable urban communities that are purposely thinking about how do you provide for wellness, how do you provide for aging in place, how do you provide for community, which are the things that elderly people are looking. And if you do that, you might be able to tap into people of higher equity. Um, so uh, the other, other model that's out there is there are um, senior housing developments built that are um, high-end senior housing where you pay a subscription fee to enter uh, and you have um, uh, a, a number of amenities that come along with that. So again, it might be in some cases it's as much as you, know, you put half a million dollars down, you move in, you pay rent. Uh, it's a very nice uh, place. It's got you know, uh, a lot of amenities, a lot of services that come along with that. And then you or your heirs, when you move out, you get either all or some of that back. That's the model. We thought that one could use that model to generate uh, capital uh, for a downtown mixed-use place. So um, here are the sort of key components uh, to that. One, is that um, our belief, and I think this is consistent with you know, uh, evidence that we've read and articles that we see continuing, that many seniors are looking for an authentic place. They aren't necessarily looking to move to a place that's seniors only. They'd like to be where there are young people, they'd like to be part of a community, they'd like to be part of a real sort of downtown place. So diversity, economic, age diversity, uh, but walkable uh, and vibrant uh, is key. Um, because um, of sort of the next category, community and activities. You know, we think purposely trying to figure out how do we build community in a, in a, in a, um, in a building uh, is important. So we would want to put some resources to having uh, space, to programming that space, to sort of get neighbors to know neighbors, to have events. Uh, but um, 
uh, a lot of that activity is found in your community. So unlike a um, isolated uh, auto-dependent senior housing where they're going to offer yoga classes and, and art classes, in this building you ride down the elevator and you go to the art class down the street and you go to the yoga class down the street with everybody else. Um, we might help facilitate, we might advertise, we might you know, aggregate those sources, uh, but you don't have to bring them in because they're just part of the community if you have a vibrant downtown. Next slide, please. Ne next slide, there we go. Um, uh, so wellness, again, you know, some on-site component, but also looking at tapping into what's out there uh, in the community and then and then support and this this really comes from the the response to the marketplace on the first project that we did we built a um, you know created uh, uh, 23 higher end units um, went out to the marketplace rented them very quickly uh, they've been rented ever since um, and we built an independent senior living facility and we didn't know it you know so we have people there about 70 percent of our residents that are seniors that are aging in place, that at some point need home health care, at some point they need house cleaning, at some point they need somebody to check on them, and, um, and we didn't build that into the program. So this concept is that um, we'd build that in. We'd have an on-site concierge, somebody who is on call in the building, who knows them, who can check on them, who they can call if they're trying to figure out how to program their television or program their thermostat or, or, or arrange for a whole set of services. Um, valet parking, as people's um, uh, mobility declines, but they still need to get places, can we bring their car around? Um, the restaurants, um, again, we don't necessarily, if we have um, uh, uh, restaurants within walking distance, um, there may be a way to aggregate you know, a meal plan where we have a debit card and we work something out with the area restaurants to tap into that market, uh, but take right down the elevator and walk to restaurants. In many cases, the restaurants are in their building, so there are, there are opportunities to be part of the community to eat out, um, which doesn't have to have uh, you know, staff and a restaurant built into the building. Um, so those are the amenities. If you switch to the next slide. This is, a, um, this is effectively just a, a little snapshot of the economics for the individual for this type of project. So if I was um, looking at my choices, um, the first column being a walkable urban apartment, uh, you know, 1,100 square feet, um, a project that, that we would propose, there might be an entrance fee of $125,000, um, a regular apartment, um, you know, uh, uh, a suburban apartment where there's a deposit. These are actually numbers from real projects, by the way. Uh, condo, where you might buy a condo, and then a, a, a senior housing place that also has a subscription that we're talking about. You know, at the end of the day, you know, if you were to go talk to your tax advisor, your monthly out-of-pocket um, isn't all that different between the urban apartment, the drivable suburban apartment, and even the condo, um, if you're depending on your, what you're financing and what you're not, the, um, the deposit in the case of um, the model that we've built, um, when, they, when we re-rent their space, they or their heirs get the full $125,000 back. So it's a, it's a more modest investment or deposit than some of the higher end senior housing. And we think the level of amenities from what we've been able to look at um, is, is comparable uh, in terms of access to those different quality of life factors, wellness, and sense of community that that population is looking for. So, you know, what does that mean? You know, if you can take, uh, you know, if you can carve out in, in 17 units, uh, you know, 20% of those so that, that are not tagged into this, we always need with new market projects, 20% that are at 80% medium family income, the balance of those might bring a couple million dollars of equity that effectively in your pro forma you don't need to pay back. That is, those are deposits. You have, a, you have a liability, I suppose, if the project goes under to pay, them, pay that back, uh, but that risk, operational risk, is pretty small. Uh, but we're not servicing that as debt. Uh, and we're paying it back out as a deposit when we re-rent re the unit. So it is capital that you use to build the project, capital that you use really to build some of these amenities into the project that you couldn't otherwise afford to do, uh, and therefore to be able to provide uh, support uh, for people to age in really an authentic urban place as opposed to uh, an independent uh, 
um, age-specific uh, senior housing project. Uh, and at the end of the day, a couple thousand dollars a month or a deposit and a couple thousand dollars a month, even an affordable assisted living, if that's where you're going, you know, is four to six thousand dollars a month. That's the cost. Uh, so this becomes, we think, a very um, uh, marketable piece. And that case study that we showed you a few slides back, that grocery store building, the upper story, uh, the upper floors of that building were designed for this tenant financed housing. And it brought to the project about $2 million in equity uh, to be able to build that. Um, I think early on I said, um, you know, we like historic buildings because we can tap into federal historic tax credits. Um, that doesn't exist for new buildings. So for new buildings uh, in this project, we are utilizing a um, tenant uh, financed housing to help close some of that gap. Uh, we're also um, working with the town to create a TIF, tax incremental financing, to help with the uh, some of the site work uh, to close the gap on, on that phase. So, next slide. All right, I think that's the end of the presentation. So, looking forward to questions. Um, so, just a reminder for folks, um, if you have questions, uh, please uh, type it into the chat box or send us a tweet at Locust Developers. And with that, Bob, uh, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions, so we're going to try to do a wrap around and see if we can fit a bunch of them before we close at 2 o'clock. So the first question um, was, uh, is it important to have multiple projects uh, to make the overall project pencil, or can this be done uh, with one single project? That, that's a good question. Uh, project scale is important because of the complexity and the transactional cost. You know, we generally think that we'd like to push $20 million for a project, um, and part of that is because of the high cost of bringing in grant sources. And for those that are aware of federal money, there's environmental assessments, and there's a lot of legal costs around uh, uh, and fees that come out of new market tax credit projects. Um, we have projects that we penciled out that are closer to 10, um, and there have certainly been new market projects that are, have been done you know, in the five to eight million dollar range, but um, in a mixed use project, uh, though, that would be pretty rare to be that small, where you have multiple tenants, multiple sources of financing, um, you just don't have the economy of scale. So it doesn't need to be multiple buildings, but it needs to be of a scale that starts to cross the you know, 10 to 20, 20 million. Likewise, getting above 20, that project I showed you is actually 50 million with both phases, but you know, 20 to 25 million is, starts to get tough to find new market allocation beyond that uh, for uh, just in terms of how people are parceling out on an annual basis that fund. So there's kind of an upper limit as well. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, the next question is, uh, you, you, throughout your presentation, you spoke a lot about new markets and historic. Uh, could you uh, give a very quick, uh, what are the eligibilities? How can one go about getting new markets or historic tax credits? So uh, new market tax credits, and they're different, by the way. New market tax credits are uh, only available in eligible census tracts. And you can go to um, a couple of websites type in new market tax district census, census tracts and see where those exist. Those are uh, low income census tracts uh, and they are sprinkled across uh, every state in the union. So um, many cities have them um, and many small towns and even some rural areas. It sort of depends on the medium wage compared to your state and the overall um, uh, wage uh, within that census tract. If you have a project that's in the census tract, um, you then have the ability to go out and see if one of the allocates, the community development entities that get allocation from the federal government, will fund your project. And that's a competitive, it's become more competitive in the last year process, where often they are looking at community and economic impact. How many jobs do you create? How do you support this disadvantaged community? Are there services provided to the community? How are you transforming that community? We feel, and we're working better at metrics and trying to show this, that a downtown revitalization, although quite frankly it's more complex, most new market projects are going to single-use industrial projects. It's easy to count jobs out of that. But downtown revitalization, you know, when you look at, especially in a, in a relatively small place, uh, can double the grand list in a downtown and reduce the vacancy rate by half. And 
and you know double the number of jobs in that town. Those things, uh, you know, and residences. Like, there's no jobs and and housing, but those housing folks are shopping downstairs. That's what creates the jobs in this building and several others. So it has a ripple effect, a multiplier effect that we think is very, um, very significant. And um, we're trying to get better at trying to communicate that to the CDEs so they have more confidence to, uh, to spend money on these more complex projects. New uh, historic tax credits are, um, uh, you are entitled to federal historic tax credits by right if you have a building that is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. That has some complexity to it. You're entitled to it. You're not entitled to get cash for it, though. Uh, as the owner, you have to have a bona fide partnership with an entity who can take those tax credits. That's complicated. Again, bigger projects, more experienced developers are more likely to find it. Usually the people who can take those tax credits are large banks, um, you know, community banks who are looking for you know, community investments uh, for, uh, to meet CRA goals, whatever those are. Uh, but um, yeah, that's monetizing federal historic tax credits are a challenge. Um, but it's a program that's been around for many years. Um, both of those programs, by the way, are currently not in the uh, tax reform bill that came out of the House and Senate, and that's a longer conversation. You know, we, I think people in the industry hope that that and think that they might come back uh, or be there at the end of the day, but at the moment um, they're at risk. Um, so key pieces for us that are uh, being threatened. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Uh, a couple more questions. So first, um, you, does the case study project you uh, showed, does it work without housing? Does it pencil out without housing? Uh, it would if we had more office to take over the housing. So, so um, generally, our, our marketplace, the housing is the stronger market. Um, I've actually, it's gotten to the point where we can do a market study and go to the bank with a market study, and they actually believe that we'll rent it, you know, with the market study in hand, because we've been able to show that there's a market demand. This is essentially that, you know, the large demographic of baby boomers uh -huh. and millennials who are trying to move into urban places, and there's no products that, uh, out there for nice places. So housing, in many ways, subsidizes the rest of it. Uh, so it's just the opposite. I don't think we can do it without housing unless we had, you know, an anchor office tenant who can afford to pay higher rent. You know, if we had a state office building coming downtown and they could pay me 20 bucks a square foot, that would be easy. Um, but if you're doing that, you might, you know, our argument would be to say to the state office, well, why don't you only take half the floor and we'll double the impact of the community because we'll put housing above you. You know, it's, it's a better invest, it's a better return for the community and it's a better impact economically to put people who live down there as well as people who work to shop downtown, to not have to drive as far and so on. So, yeah. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions. Specifically, um, you started this conversation with a slide that showed the overall construction cost of producing a mixed-use development project. Uh, I think it was uh, the number was $300 uh, dollars, uh, per square foot. Um, how do we address the high cost nature of mixed-use development? And in pairing that with whether it's in an urban context or in a rural community, cost is cost. And so it makes sense for above market rate projects. How do you do this for, let's say, low uh, or what we call traditional affordable housing projects or affordable projects for our tenants and so forth? Yeah, no, that, that's the crux of the project. Uh, sorry, the crux of the problem. You know, in our world, there really are the only professional developers are affordable housing developers because they're using a similar subsidy called low-income housing tax credits. Um, they, their numbers would not work uh, without deeper subsidies than the new market tax credits can bring as well. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe, as somebody who's in the design and the construction industry, I don't think there's a model to drive the cost of construction down. I don't think the solution there is there. The solution is in getting our economies to work better through job creation, through other investments of economic development. I'll give you a couple of examples. When we did this first project um, that's been operating for four years, we showed the marketplace that folks would pay higher rent, both for retail and for office. And several buildings in the surrounding area started investing in their buildings. And they you know, it's unfortunate. There was a, somebody who was complaining, well, the landlord raised my rent and I can't pay that. I'm moving out. But somebody else stepped back in and rented that retail space afterwards and is still there and is doing fine at a higher price point. What that does is it 
increases the value of those properties in the town. It increases the ability of property owners to reinvest in their buildings and renovate it. Um, and it's not the fault of the retailers if they can't pay higher rent or even the office. It's, you know, we need more traffic, more people so that they can afford to pay higher rent. And if that, you know, spark, if you will, to this local economy works, you'll generate higher revenue um, by virtue of this investment and a transformative investment in the community. That's generally, that is the idea, is that we spark the economy to work a little better, a little faster, and we start building on that momentum as opposed to status quo. Many people buy buildings at $50 a square foot, and they either don't invest and they continue to decline in their condition, or they sometimes they can invest a, a unit at a time. I roll over a unit, I'll make it a little better, but it doesn't really change the underlying economy. These projects, this, this investment can start to um, uh, have that economy, local economy, start to work better. And, and then hopefully, you know, some years down the road, we don't need these subsidies. The rents are higher. Rents can afford to start putting these projects together. Cost to build is pretty much the cost to build driven off of labor material costs, um, you know, the other drivers in construction, which are, which are not very much something that you can change. Thanks, Bob. Um, and the last two questions, um, and just a reminder for folks, uh, we will be circulating this webinar as well as Bob's contact information. If you have additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to the Locust staff. Um, but Bob, one of the questions that came um, in terms of uh, uh, from your earlier slide, can you speak more to uh, your slide said dedicated IRA? Can you speak a little bit more what that means and how does that look in the capital stack? Yeah, so the dedicated IRA, uh, and I guess we didn't have the capital stack slide in this, um, but effectively it is a way to fund that preferred equity slot. Um, so these are uh, folks that are last on the stack, you know, behind the the original, the actual equity investors. Um, it acts like debt, but it is equity, and it would mean rather than reaching into your checkbook, you can slide some money that's currently into an IRA over to uh, a project IRA um, and, and let it uh, sit there with a 3% return on investment, which is what we offered for the 10 years, which it then gets repaid. Um, you know, uh, one note on that, it is a clever, um, you know, way for people to participate, it is not without risk. I mean, real estate development is not a low risk proposition. You know, our, our, um, our uh, uh, investment advisors are, you know, caution us to promote this too heavily. Oh, anybody who has an IRA can invest in these projects. Well, you know, there's some percentage, some chance that you're not going to get paid back. And so you need to be, you know, have enough equity so that this can be at risk. But it is a way to, to move um, pre-tax dollars over, and it's, it's money that you have already set aside. So it was pretty effective. I don't know what percentage of that $600,000 we raised, raised through the IRA, uh, dedicated IRA, but it's probably a third to a half of that $600,000 came through with donations in the twenty to $25,000 uh, amount uh, through that. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the challenge on the infrastructure side and what strategies have you seen uh, used in the communities like yours, rural or urban, uh, to address that? You mentioned earlier uh, TIF districts. Have you seen any other strategies to deal with that portion of uh, the performa? Yeah, that's the only strategy that, I mean, we, you know, the in infrastructure and, and hazardous conditions are sort of two variables that um, are, you know, can be significantly different from site to site. You know, if you just have a, a building rehab that doesn't have any site and the municipality has infrastructure parking and otherwise to support you, you're not carrying the burden of that. Uh, but in a project where those do exist, um, there, is, there are Brownsfield uh, grant money, which um, I think EPA has a $200,000 per lot limitation. We're fortunate to have three lots in the last project we're doing, so we're applying for, I think, two of those. Um, but it's tricky. You have to be a nonprofit to apply. So truthfully, we, we had the, um, uh, the local development corporation buy the property, hold it while we got the EPA money to do the cleanup, and then we're you know, buy, buying it back from the de local development corporation. Um, anyway, jumping through hoops, but it's a way to access that uh, EPA money uh, and have it come in as free money. Um, the, um, the other, the TIF district, again, for those that don't know, that tax incremental finance is usually public investments around a project 
It's a bond the community takes out. It's paid back by the incremental increase in the grand list value of your project. That's a bond vote. You've got to go to the voters and sell this thing and have everybody buy into it. It is possible, um, but it's a great way to peel off some of the site work, particularly if it's parking and 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 site, you know, sidewalk improvements and other things that sort of need to get done. Um, the last piece is uh, community development block grants. You know, you can apply, you can use that for um, any number of uses. Uh, again, some other nuances on that. We've had projects where, you know, uh, you get that funding and it comes with Davis-Bacon uh, uh, wage rates and a project, um, you know, the increase in the project cost exceeds the grant. Uh, for three quarters of a million on a project of this scale. So anyway, there's some ways to sort of work through that. Um, and you also need to have a nonprofit in the organizational structure somewhere to accept that money and not have a tax liability in the interim time period because there's multiple companies. This is why my partner's in a tax attorney, by the way. So he's the one who figures out all the nuances of how we create multiple companies, take them in, you know, manage them through a compliance period and get them back out. It's also why these projects have a huge legal fee uh, to figure out this complexity. Uh, thank you, Bob. I think one last question, and that is from your uh, perspective of doing these projects on the ground, uh, we have a number of folks who are uh, economic development managers or represent localities as well as developers on this call. Uh, what is maybe the best policy solution that you've seen that could make these type of projects pencil easier? Hmm. Well, that that's a good question. I mean, it's um, I, I think I think to, I'm an engineer, and I would back up to define the problem. You know, if you want to understand what the policy solutions might be, understand the problem. The problem is that the economy does not work. The problem is that it's a value of 100 and a cost of 300. And you can't solve that necessarily by adding requirements or, you know, raising the bar. You know, there's a lot of policy things that don't work. You can't solve it by debt alone. You can't solve it by equity alone. You know, at the moment, there needs to be free money or you need to have an economy that works better. So our solutions tend to be, you know, partnerships, get people to um, step up and hold hands and jump in this thing together. Uh, get folks to pay higher rent. You know, again, I, I, we have a state office building that went into a similar project, and at the end of the day, the state's paying over 20. They're paying, you know, six bucks a square foot higher than the going rate in that town uh, because they knew they needed to pay that to get the deal to work, and they knew that their office workers would generate economic return and and transformative values for the community. So you really do need everybody: federal, state, town working with you, local uh, community investors, private sector, uh, if you're going to make, get these projects off the ground. Um, and, and I think that's the key. And somehow you get that group together and you just work the problem and strategize and come up with different ideas and see if you can't find a way to close those gaps. And, you know, it doesn't hurt. I'll say one last parting thing. You know, in the projects that, that are successful, that we look at, um, they're not, it's not a big city, a $20 million project in a big city. These are projects where the community says, we have to do this somehow for the sake of our community. If that's the, the common understanding of the problem, uh, you'll find a way to make it happen. Uh, so that, that's, I think, is important. Thank you, Bob. And I just want to reiterate, I think you're absolutely right, that for projects like these that are not within the hot markets, it really does require, I think, the most important partnerships, policies that promote that, whether at the federal, state, local levels. But more importantly, this is why Walkable Communities is uh, what we believe the desire pre preference. In order to achieve those rents, you have to figure out ways to lower the cost. And oftentimes we find that if you could create communities that can lower the cost of transportation, lower the cost of infrastructure improvements, um, those are allow those projects to pencil a little bit better and at the very least generate the economic activity that you can leverage to potentially subsidize greater affordable housing and greater anti-displacement strategies in that community. And so with that, um, I wanted to thank Bob uh, for your uh, great presentation to remind everyone uh, this presentation will be on our website. If you have signed up, you will receive a link directly accessing it. Also, just a reminder, as Bob mentioned, the uh, Locust last week launched our Rebuild America campaign, which is organizing developers and investors across the country to really push Congress, state, and local governments to make sure policies like the historic tax credit, new markets, and others are in place to make these projects a little easier to pencil out to make sure that we have vibrant 
economically sustainable and inclusive communities for every American. So if you're interested, please go to our website today, join the campaign. Uh, we need your voice here in DC. Uh, as uh, Bob mentioned, Congress is considering a major tax reform bill and we need all the help we can get. So with that, thank you again for joining this webinar. Uh, again, this will be uh, available on our website and tune in to next week until we uh, feature our next webinar series. With that, take care.